And welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the podcast where every season we select six movies all related to a single theme. And over six different episodes, we explore how each of these movies got made. And then we give you a full review start to finish with snarky comments and stupid voices and all manner of surprises. It's genuinely a good time, and usually nobody gets it. I'm Chad Cooper, and along with my lifelong friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell, we're making our way through this season's theme, Die Hard Ons, featuring six movies that all ripped off the classic action film, Die Hard. This episode features the action-adventure movie, Cliffhanger. If you never heard of the term cliffhanger, that's a word used to describe the ending of an episode of a serial drama that leaves the audience in suspense, wanting more. Back in the olden days of movies, audiences would be left holding their breath as a character was just dangling off the side of a cliff. That's why they called it a cliffhanger. Some classic examples include Who Shot JR on Dallas? Or Who Shot Montgomery Burns on The Simpsons? Or maybe uh, when Hank figured out that Walter White was the notorious drug kingpin Heisenberg. That was a good cliffhanger. And oh, the Reichenbach Fall in the BBC Sherlock series with Benedict Cumberbatch. That was a pretty good one. Those are all some great cliffhangers. Man, there's just so many great cliffhangers. But you know what? There's only one terrible cliffhanger, and that's the one we're featuring in episode three of this season, a film that's just die hard, but up on a mountain. Sylvester Stallone is the hero of our movie, mm, sort of. John Lithgow is the bad guy, mm, sort of. Look, if you're new here, you should know that most of the movies we review are more often than not terrible. And this one is no different. Yeah, enough of my jibber jabber. Let's strap on our gear, take the first step towards the summit of this movie mountain with the help of our Sherpa guide, Mr. Bo Ransdell, as he comes in and introduces us to 1993's Cliffhanger. Yodly. If you want to rip off Die Hard, you need a few key ingredients. First, you need a main character who is a bit of an everyman, a guy who gets caught up in an adventure due to circumstances beyond his control. In Die Hard, John McClane is simply attending a party in the hopes of reconciling with his wife, unaware he is about to become embroiled in an elaborate plot to steal bearer bonds from Nakatomi Plaza. For this episode featuring Die Hard ripoffs, we are talking cliffhanger, and we can tick that first box right off. Stallone's character, Gabe Walker, is your run-of-the-mill Rocky Mountain Rescue Team member who scales cliffs with his bare hands. Well, alright, maybe that's a stretch, but I'll allow it. It's definitely better than Steven Seagal's Casey Ryback, who is an unstoppable killing machine trained by the armed forces. So ingredient number two, then, is a compelling villain with a complicated plan and charm to spare. And who did Rennie Harlan, director of Cliffhanger, tap to play such a villain? Why, none other than David Bowie. Wait, what? Oh, oh, right, David Bowie was who Rennie Harlan wanted to be in this role, but that wasn't gonna happen. So Harlan went to his next choice, Christopher Walken. And that's who was gonna play the role of Eric Quaylen in this movie. Unfortunately, a few weeks before production was to begin, Walken also backed out after apparently reading the script, and so Rennie Harlan was scrambling for that special kind of actor, a man who can embody mystique and threat in equal measure, and what man would be capable of such a feat and on short notice too? Why, you'd need a real thespian like Nicolas Cage. Enter the villain of this episode's film, John Lithgow. Some of you listening might know John Lithgow best as Dick Solomon from the sitcom Third Rock from the Sun, but I assure you, John Lithgow is more than a comic actor. He is, however, an actor through and through. One might even say he was born to it. And speaking of being born, that happened in 1945 in Rochester, New York, to Sarah Jane and Arthur Washington Lithgow III. Now that's a name. His mother was an actor, and his father was a director and theatrical producer who ran a theater in Princeton, New Jersey. For the record, John Lithgow is also the descendant of eight Mayflower passengers, including a colonial governor named William Bradford. All of the above makes him not only bred for the stage, but one of the top eight whitest people in America. With his father touring around with theatrical work, John Lithgow often landed in Yellow Springs, Ohio to savor all the Midwest had to offer. 
His babysitter during some of these times was Coretta Scott King. Yes, that Coretta Scott King, the wife of slain civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr., who was not slain and had not yet married or met his future wife. But still, that's crazy, right? Anywho, the young John, surrounded by actors and directors and culture of all sorts, took to such a life. He was playing Bach as a child and was consumed with reading and music, though he showed no early signs of wanting to follow his family onto the stage. He graduated high school from Princeton High in New Jersey and went on to Harvard on account of all the whiteness and privilege he was born into. That is not to say that John Lithgow didn't deserve his leg up in the world, but he definitely had one. In the late 60s, John Lithgow graduated magnum cum laude with an emphasis on history and literature from Harvard, and during his college years, he appeared in a stage production of Gilbert and Sullivan's Utopia Unlimited, and he credits this role as the one that sold him on the idea of becoming an actor like his mother. He also met his first wife, Jean, there. Having graduated from Harvard, Lithgow then won a Fulbright scholarship to attend the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. Just a few years later, Lithgow would appear in his first feature film with the extravagant title Dealing, colon, or the Berkeley to Boston 40 Brick Lost Bag Blues. The movie was based on a book by Michael Crichton, yes, that Michael Crichton, of Jurassic Park fame, and co-written by Douglas Crichton, although they published under the pseudonym Michael Douglas. The movie has some real heavy hitters in early roles, including Barbara Hershey, Charles Durning, and Paul Sorvino, along with John Lithgow. The next year, 1973, he made his Broadway debut in a play called The Changing Room and received a Tony nomination for his role. For the next few years, he went from play to play, working with the likes of Lynn Redgrave and Meryl Streep, and accumulating quite the reputation as a great dramatic stage actor. Then Lithgow had his first collaboration with director Brian De Palma in a movie entitled Obsession, starring Cliff Robertson and Genevieve Bujold. And then he was off. TV appearances, TV movies, actual movie movies. Lithgow's star was on the rise, and not just in the snooty Broadway circles. He was becoming famous everywhere. For most of the world, the first real look at the genius of Lithgow came when he reunited with Brian De Palma for 1981's Blowout, acting against one of the biggest stars in the world at the time, John Travolta. If you've never seen Blowout, please do. It is a masterpiece of 20th century cinema and boasts one of the bleakest, most effective endings of any thriller you're likely to see. And Lithgow as Burke, the villain of the film, is chilling. Keep that in mind when we start talking trash about why he's the heavy and cliffhanger later. Around this same time, Lithgow's first marriage was falling apart, thanks to an affair he had with a co-star. After the dissolution of that marriage, Lithgow put himself into therapy to get his collective shit together, and says he changed his life in a number of positive ways as a result. I hear you, John. After starting his tenure in psychotherapy, Lithgow rededicated himself to his craft and was rewarded with his first Oscar nomination for the role of Roberta Muldoon in The World According to Garp, an adaptation of the John Irving novel, which just so happens to be my favorite book. So, you know, there's that. Next, he'd appear in cinemas in the excellent George Miller segment of the not-so-good Twilight Zone the movie as the panicking airplane passenger who sees a gremlin on the wing of his plane. He wouldn't have long to wait for his next Oscar nod, as he would be nominated again in 1984 for Terms of Endearment, another pretty terrific film. The same year, he played the small-town preacher in a movie I've still never seen called Footloose, and then popped up in the better-than-you'd-expect sequel to 2001 A Space Odyssey, 2010 The Year We Make Contact. Spoilers, we did not actually make contact in 2010. In the mid-80s, John Lithgow was everywhere. A good-hearted teacher in the Manhattan Project, a father housing a Sasquatch in Harry and the Hendersons, a bunch of crazy people when he reteamed with Brian De Palma for Raising Cain, the corporate sleaze in Santa Claus the Movie, which you can hear more about on this very program, Season 4, Episode 6, naturally. By this point, not only had John Lithgow established himself professionally, he'd also found wife number two, and that one stuck. In fact, they're still married to this day, over 40 years later, so good for him, right? He set up his second marriage, Actors swing wildly between arrogance and self-doubt. I never completely believed the praise, 
although I've become deeply injured by anything negative said of me. I'm married to a very tough-minded woman. She doesn't let me get away with anything. She's the great ego deflector, and we all need that. He was also adding to his list of villainous roles into the 1990s and the 2000s, including voicing Lord Farquaad in Shrek, and opposite Denzel Washington in Ricochet. He starred in ballets, he started writing children's books, and he became the first actor to ever give a commencement speech at Harvard University. In the past 20 years, Lithgow has not slowed. He's done limited run series like The Crown, where he played Winston Churchill. He has continued his pursuit of children's literature and expanded into verse with his skewering of Trump-era events in a poetry book called Dumpty, which was followed by a sequel, Trumpty Dumpty Wanted a Crown, in 2020. His politics are certainly left of the dial, and he's performed in pieces on stage and television intended to further the rights of the LGBTQ community and illuminate measures that would limit freedoms for marginalized communities. He also turned in the best season of the serial killer show Dexter and reprised that role just last year in the Dexter revival. Basically, the guy is still acting, still writing, still performing, and shows no signs of slowing or stopping despite the fact that the guy is almost 80 years old as of this recording. And while I may have poked a little fun at the fact he was born into great circumstance, you can credit him with not resting on those laurels or wasting that leg up. He has proven himself time and again as a champion for the causes in which he believes, and a veteran actor who has given back to his community of performers. And so why would a guy this talented, this respected, be in a movie like Cliffhanger? Well, that, my friends, is a story for another day. Oh, it's not. It's today. Oh, well. To begin with, Cliffhanger was never anybody's first choice. The production company behind the film, Carol Co. Pictures, had signed Sylvester Stallone to a comedy about rival neighbors called Bartholomew vs. Neff, a movie intended to co-star John Candy. That movie would have been directed by John Hughes, and all of that sounds more interesting than the movie that resulted from this deal, aka Cliffhanger. Unfortunately, Bartholomew vs. Neff was dropped by the company, and so Carol Co., wanting to keep their deal with Stallone alive, offered him two other films. Neither of those movies were Cliffhanger, mind you, but we'll get to that. The first was called Isobar, a science fiction thriller that would be helmed by Independence Day director Roland Emmerich, or possibly Ridley Scott. Joel Silver was going to produce that one, and Kim Basinger would co-star. Sounds interesting, right? Well, thanks to creative differences between Silver and Carol Co., the movie floundered and was eventually abandoned entirely. The second movie Sloan was offered by Carol Co. was called Gale Force, a movie that was also a diehard ripoff, only instead of a location, it was circumstance, described as diehard in a hurricane. Rennie Harlan was attached to direct Stallone, who would play a Navy SEAL who had to defend a small town from modern-day pirates in the midst of a hurricane. Carol Coe spent about $4 million on various screenwriters to help shape the story and deliver a good script for the movie, not to mention the $3 million they paid Rennie Harlan to helm the movie based on the fact that Rennie Harlan had done Die Hard 2. Carol Coe even brought in Basic Instinct writer Joe Esterhaz to take a turn at Gale Force transforming the script, unsurprisingly, into an erotic thriller, which nobody wanted, so that was wisely ditched. And in addition to having some trouble getting the script in shape, there was the larger problem of filming. Hurricanes are notoriously difficult to plan for, and the special effects required to make a hurricane happen for the length of a movie is pretty pricey. And so two weeks before production was going to begin on Gale Force, Carol Co. pulled the plug on the movie, citing the expense of the film and apparently having little faith in the project after spending millions on its development. Footnote, Rennie Harlan got to keep his $3 million for not directing Gale Force. And so while Gale Force was a bust, Carol Co. did have Rennie Harlan and Sylvester Stallone on the hook, so they pitched him another idea. This one, Die Hard on a Mountain. The script came from Michael France, who would go on to write the James Bond film Goldeneye, but Stallone, being an Oscar-nominated writer, and let that sink in for a second, wanted to take a turn on the script and made enough changes that Carol Coe petitioned the Writers Guild of America to give him script credit. 
as it would happen, Michael Franz took the idea from somebody else who ended up getting some money and a story by credit on the movie. Speaking of money and the movie, it would be budgeted at $70 million and Carol Co. brought in some help with that from TriStar Pictures, who ponied up half the money for distribution rights for the film. And even more financiers were brought in on account of Carol Co. not being in great financial shape, and the studio would eventually fail due to some flops and bad investments. After all these financing deals were struck to get Cliffhanger off the ground, Carol Co. would get very little of the profits from the movie, which didn't help their cause very much. The cast and crew were shipped off to Italy where they substituted the mountains near Cortina d'Ampezzo for the Rockies. There were a few things shot in the good old US of A, namely the stunt where a man was to move from one plane to another via a cable between two aircraft. It turned out doing something like that was illegal in Italy, which is probably right, but the US had no such restrictions. If you sign the right paperwork, you can do whatever the hell you want. So the stunt was pulled off and it is quite impressive. Simon Crane is the guy on the wire for this stunt, and he would set a Guinness World Record for the costliest aerial stunt ever put on film and get a cool million dollars to do that one stunt. Stallone later stated that he did the movie Cliffhanger largely to get over his fear of heights, despite the fact that he did very little of the climbing stunts that was usually reserved for professional climbers who were forced to bulk up to Stallone's size for their stand-in roles in the movie. Rennie Harlan himself wanted to prove that, hey, it's safe to make this movie, so he strapped on a harness and threw himself over the side of a mountain to show cast and crew alike that everything was kosher. My notes here indicate that he did survive that and went on to direct this movie. The cast was filled out with Michael Rooker, who we've seen before on Pick 6 in Fantasy Island, Season 12, Episode 6, if you want to catch up to that one. And he plays the bitter best friend, Ralph Waite, as the old artist Frank shows up, who is best known for his role as the dad on The Waltons, and Janine Turner, who was a big hit as Maggie on Northern Exposure, but never quite made the same splash on the big screen, plays the love interest, Jesse. Before its release, the movie was test screened for audiences, and Stallone said it went bad. Real bad. Harlan had packed the movie with crazy stunts, including the main character, Gabe, leaping dozens of feet across ravines and doing Spider-Man-like climbing stunts. Basically, the audience wasn't buying it and thought the movie was, in a word, ridiculous. So the movie was recut to make the stunts seem less absurd. Also edited, that scene where a dude tries to shoot a rabbit. Audiences were not cool with anyone even a villain machine gunning down a fluffy bunny, so that was also re-edited so that the bunny lived. And then the movie was released unto the world on May 28th, 1993. Now to be fair, it was a big hit. It made over $250 million. And the critics were largely kind to the movie. Though Lithgow, who keep in mind, had joined this production very, very late after everyone else dropped out, took a lot of heat for his shaky accent, and lots of people also pointed out that the rock climbing in the movie is not representative of how, you know, people climb rocks. The movie did spawn a video game, and that opening scene where Stallone watches a woman fall to her death was parodied in that Ace Ventura sequel, so Cliffhanger managed to not only be a financial hit, it seeped into the cultural consciousness to some degree. There was a sequel plan called The Dam, in which our hero has to do all of his climbing on, you know, a dam. But that never materialized. Which brings us here. Enough of the prepping, let's get to some climbing. Is this movie as good as the 67% Rotten Tomatoes score suggests? Or is this ice-caked movie a frozen dud? For the answer to that question, it's time to call in my own rescue team in the form of co-host Chad Cooper to put the microscope on this chilly adventure. Ladies and gentlemen, Gabes and Quaylens, it's 1993's Cliffhanger.
And welcome back to yet another episode of Pick 6 Movies. I, as ever, am your guide through the mountains of poop. And along with me <laughs> is the rescue team, the guy in the chopper, mm -hmm. uh, Chad Cooper. Welcome to Cliffhanger. Thank you, Bo. I refer to you as my shit Sherpa. You're not the first, nor will you be the last person <laughs> to refer to me as such. I've got a lot of nicknames as it happens. Uh, that asshole, <laughs> the shit Sherpa, that fucking asshole. Asshole. You know, a lot. A lot of different ones. <laughs> we are, of course, in the, the dead center of our season, uh, season 19, which we yes. are calling Die Hard Ons. Mm -hmm. All about movies that kind of rip off the movie Die Hard. Yes. Not kind of. They do rip off the movie <laughs> Die Hard. Yeah. And this is one of the more brazen ones, I feel like. Even though it doesn't have a Nakatomi Plaza or anything, this hits all the beats. Yeah. He even puts on the sweater from Die Hard 2. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's Rennie Harlan. <laughs> he, they probably had it in the trailer. <laughs> In the trunk of his car. Yeah. Please, Sylvester, put this on. I think you'll look quite good. Oh, yes, you're very fetching with it. I don't know if that's how Reddy Harlan talks, but that's how he does in my head. And you would be surprised how often I hear Reddy Harlan in my head. Oh, boy. Look at you making the breakfast. You should have some muslix. <laughs> Shut up, Reddy Harlan. I'm having lucky charms. <laughs> oh, the marshmallows make my teeth hurt. It's so much sugar. And so forth. Yeah, so we're doing a uh, cliffhanger. Reddy Harlan. Let's cliffhanger uh-huh which star sylvester stallone kind of on the back end of when he was a super big action star uh, you know was it eh. i mean he got a pretty good payday he got 12 mil for this didn't he this is around the time of like a demolition man which i have a lot of time for but you know it feels like he started <laughs> to get a little fancy in fact demolition man was the very next movie but then you have the specialist which is terrible and then judge dread which is terrible and then assassins that nobody gave a shit about and then daylight that nobody cared about when did he make Copland? when he got fat that was yeah, a pretty good movie that is a really good movie and it's in 97 after he did all the movies i just mentioned and his star was really starting to fade and so he was like hey what if i do a real movie and so he did copland which is a very good film and he's good in it but then he backed it up with get carter that nobody gave a shit about and then driven that nobody gave a shit about except us because we almost did it and yeah. then a bunch of movies that you have never heard of i assure you when did he make stop or my mom will shoot stop or my mom will shoot is that's like 80s uh um, rhinestone yeah. oscar remember when he was trying to make comedies right but that's all in the rear view at this point but yeah, yeah. That was a dark time for everyone. Did we see Stopper by Mom Will Shoot at a dollar theater together? Or was that cop and a half with Burt Reynolds and that kid who was on the Smuckers commercials? Yeah, I, that had to be cop and a half because I've never seen Stopper My Mom Will Shoot. Not yet. Or, or <laughs> not sober, at least. Not so that I remember it. But that was the movie he did right before Cliffhanger. <laughs> so it was Oscar, then Stopper My Mom Will Shoot, right after Tango and Cash and Rock. Rocky five. Yeah, there's a run of crap from the late eighties to the early nineties. <laughs> That is staggering. Let's talk about this crappy movie. It opens up and we get to see the last time the original TriStar movie logo with that vector line Pegasus mm -hmm. that jumps into the triangle or as ever used. R.I.P. original vector ba -ba. logo from TriStar movies. Ba -ba. Ba -ba. <laughs> ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah, it, it, it's majestic. It's lovely. I always think of the natural with that logo. I don't know why. It might even be, not, that might even be a TriStar movie, but for some reason that's the movie I associate with the TriStar Pegasus. <laughs> I think it's Columbia Pictures did the natural, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> they might have distributed it or not. I don't know. It doesn't I like matter. that Rennie Harlan gets top billing over Sylvester Stallone in this movie when the credits show up. Rennie Harlan was kind of a big deal director. I mean, <laughs> and then he mean, made this. <laughs> well, I, as far as I'm concerned, the guy never made a good movie, but uh, this was the one that he was, I mean, like he had done Die Hard 2, uh, Adventure of Fort Fairlane and then Cliffhanger were the three in a row but like he is best known by me as being the director of A Nightmare on Elm Street for The Dream Master which is maybe the worst Nightmare on Elm Street sequel it's in the conversation you made Cutthroat Island eh, yeah I, I have a little bit of affection for that more so I like Long Kiss Goodnight I, 
think is a better movie than Cutthroat Island. I and I think Long Kiss Goodnight is the best movie he did, and I think it's only so so. Deep Blue Sea is a travesty. I know a lot of people will tell you that that's a good movie, but a lot of people are wrong about a lot of things, and that's one <laughs> of them. I like in this movie opens up. We see Sylvester Stallone hanging off the side of a mountain in the snow-covered peaks of northern Italy, doing its best to pass itself off as the home of Coors Beer, aka the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. I've never been to Colorado, Bo, but these mountains do not look like any mountains that I've ever seen photographed in the United States on static film or moving pictures. This is not the good old US of A as I know it. No, of course not. And the music that they are blasting throughout uh-huh. this movie yeah this in particular is just majestic it, mm-hmm. it, it it's a real something it's to tell you like you're ladies and gentlemen buckle up you're in for an honest goodness action movie yeah it feels like you're watching an imax presentation of the ford motor company presents america this country is pretty goddamn amazing <laughs> it's soaring <Yeah. laughs> people are blasting pine scent at you ba, ba, ba. This is not Colorado. Tube spitting (laughs) water like you're going through the (laughs) mist. You do get a pretty good run of quality performers in these credits. John Lithgow, which you did an amazing job on the introduction. Michael Henry, portrait of a serial killer rooker. Mm -hmm. Janine, yes, I was on Northern Exposure Turner. Then we get a whole bunch of names that you don't recognize until a one word name shows up. Leon. Mm -hmm. And Bo, in my book, there's just one man that I've ever known who goes by the name Leon. He smoked a pipe, flew planes, he drank Cuddy Sark like it was water, and he taught himself Spanish in the twilight of his ears so that he could talk to the bartenders at the strip mall Mexican joint in our hometown, a little place that I think was called Acapulco's. Salute to Leon Kennedy. Oh man, salute. Yeah, that guy had a fascinating life. Owned a bunch of patents on weird stuff. Yeah, what a what a guy. <laughs> What a guy. And made a hell of a son who has made <laughs> a hell of a lot of interesting stories. So yeah. more on that to come. For sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and so Sylvester Stallone is playing a guy named Gabe Walker. He is a ranger with this Rocky Mountain Rescue organization that is apparently on loan to Italy. Right. I wanted to ask you, because you know how much I hate credits. That's why I, I read them now. Uh huh. Did you notice that in the credits, it says special appearance by paul winfield which i was like who's paul winfield so i looked it up and he was in sounder and he played martin luther king jr in a tv miniseries called king so his name warrants a special appearance by i was like yeah i'll stand by that paul winfield i think is an incredible actor like i want to say he he did an all-black version of king lear or something i'm not saying he's bad i was just like special appearance by because he's in this movie almost as much as sylvester stallone And then at the very end of all of these names, we get the and Ralph Waite as Frank. And I was like, who is Ralph Waite? And then you mentioned in the introduction, he was Paul Walton's Mm -hmm. on The Waltons, a show that your dead grandmother used to enjoy watching in the 70s, a TV show about the Depression. Like that was a popular thing once upon a time. It's a really weird casting decision. Like, Paul Winfield, I'll grant you, Paul Winfield is an incredible dramatic actor. Mm -hmm. And also was on set, what, two days? Maybe three? I mean, it's... Half a day. It's a real, like, what do I need to say? All right, (laughs) keep the camera rolling. We're going to get through this fast. Ralph Waite, a.k.a. Paul Walton, he had just come off of playing Kevin Costner's dad in The Bodyguard. Mm-hmm. when kevin costner takes whitney houston up into the mountains to protect her yeah, yeah, yeah it has one good line in that movie what is it i don't want to have to talk about this again oh i don't remember that movie. Th- that's when well. yeah it's not a great movie but there's that point where he beats the shit out of that guy in the kitchen and, uh-huh. and, and wordlessly beats the shit out of him and the back end of it is him saying i don't want to have to talk about this again all right it's i'm probably not good. gonna go watch that I'll oh no 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 it's terrible yeah <laughs> yeah so paul walton is frank in this movie is the character's name but he's the guy who flies the chopper the rescue chopper no he's riding in the back janine turner's flying the the chopper in this scene but the rest of the movie he's the guy in the chopper well that's because everybody else is walking around there's nobody left to fly they can all fly choppers i think 
I don't think Stallone can. They, at no, no point does he give any overtures like he understands how flight works. Let me also say, Sylvester Stallone doesn't do anything in this movie really at all. There's like three things that he does, and the rest he just farms out to other people. Janine Turner, who was on Northern Exposure, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, she's flying this helicopter. Paul Walton's in the back, and they're flying around there looking for two lost climbers who are holding up on top of this mountain peak, and they have these red smoke flares to identify where they are. And this mountain peak is something that is straight out of a Wiley e. Coyote cartoon. <laughs> it is a rock face that goes straight up into what is technically outer space. It's where Bezos and Branson went and claimed like, hey, we're in outer space. And you're like, mm, technically, yes, but <laughs> no, you're not. Let me ask you one question to slightly spoil the end of this movie. Uh-huh. Why does this movie not end at this rock formation? Well, because they steal the money and they have to get the money. Right. But from a narrative point of view, would it not make sense? Because there's all this stuff in the movie about how if Stallone doesn't rescue people or whatever the fuck, then he's never going to come off that ledge. Why would you not end the movie at the ledge that they talk about through the whole movie? I'm going to pose a bigger question. <laughs> Who climbs rocks like this? Nobody. Nobody. That's a problem, Chad. So you climb to the top of this spire, then you get to the top and, and what? You just go back down? Yeah, I think you slide. Janine Turner says, hey, Sylvester Stallone, we have visuals on Michael Rooker and Sherry Maudlin. They're at the top of, holy shit, this is a tall mountain. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. This is a whole bunch of actors and actresses returning to pick six movies. Michael Rooker, as you noted, was in Fantasy Island, but until you did that intro, I totally forgot we reviewed that movie and that he was in it because I remembered him as playing Tom Cruise's racing rival Harley Mountain Dew in Days of Thunder. Jimmy Big Red, yeah. Sherry Maudlin got killed in Outbreak when that monkey from Friends gave everybody that low-calorie version of breathable HIV. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was in the movie theater? Is that where she was? I think she was the mom that gets killed and dragged off or something. Uh. Her death in that movie was very tragic, Bo. I hope that nothing like that happens to her in this movie i'm sure she'll be fine <laughs> jimmy turner says hey sylvester stallone we can see your friend michael rooker and his girlfriend sherry maudlin she's the one who perpetually has those sweaty palms and those really thin bony fingers that are difficult to grasp especially when you're shaking hands for the first time by the way what are you doing and stallone says oh I'm, I'm just hanging around and then we see this stunt double of stallone hanging beneath a rock ledge and it's not sylvester Stallone. Very obviously not Sylvester Stallone. Which, by the way, welcome to Pick 6 Movies, Mr. Sylvester Stallone. It is shocking that we're on episode 100 and blah, 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 and we have not done a Sylvester Stallone movie to date. Yeah, that is a real stutter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's the last appearance in fairness. <laughs> no! <laughs> and we've circled Judge Dredd, ladies and gentlemen. Don't even worry about it. We're aware that that movie exists, <laughs> and it will eventually find its way onto the show. <laughs> Stallone says, hey, oh, I'm just hanging around. And Janine Turner says, no, Sylvester Stallone. I'm asking, what are you doing? Why are you up here on the side of this mountain? I just thought I'd climb up, jagged rock, see what's up here. And she says, well, I don't recognize his face, but I do recognize that But Which, Bo, is quite appropriate because if you watch this movie, you do see Sylvester Stallone hanging off the side of a rock facing. Mm -hmm. And then this red helicopter drifts down and we see Sylvester Sylvester Stallone's character like kind of climb up this fake rock, but it's not him. It's his stunt double. The shot, when you look at it, it is shockingly obvious that this paper mache rock that Sylvester Stallone is hanging off of is this light beige. And when they use the helicopter as the transition, it becomes dark brown. And the person who's actually doing the rock climbing is like 30 pounds lighter with a different shade of hair. It's like a bad magic trick where they don't have twins as assistants, but they kind of look the same. Like they might be <laughs> sisters or something something right like, why did the guy go in the box and come out with red hair and freckles <laughs> magic she's taller than him now that doesn't all right whatever dude the moment when i realized how much i hated this movie <laughs> <laughs> is right here not the stunt double that ain't really a, much of a double it's when paul walton says all right that's enough out of you rock jock <laughs> oh 
Man, that's a line that hurts your heart. I also want to go on record and say Tom Cruise did all of his rock climbing stunts in Mission Impossible 2. I think it was. Credit where credit is due. Mm -hmm. Tom Cruise is the American Jackie Chan when it comes to putting it all on the line for a good movie. Or a bad movie. He did it in The Mummy as well, and that movie is a piece of garbage. Yeah, but man, the stunt work he does, it, he puts his balls out there. A hundred percent. Like I, I have plenty of reasons that I questioned some of Tom Cruise's movies and, and choices, uh -huh. but at no point would I disrespect the amount of effort he puts into the action films and the action sequences that he does. Mm -hmm. Like, that is a guy that's going to die on set because of some <laughs> stunt that he has insisted on doing die himself. on camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's gonna be a real Ben-Hur kind of thing <laughs> where it's like, hey, this movie's only 72 minutes long because Tom Cruise died tragically and also gloriously doing this stunt. So, in Mission Impossible 7, Simon Pegg's the hero for the last act. <laughs> Janine Turner's flying this helicopter and Paul Walton, he's in the back and he says, Sylvester Stallone, we can see Michael Rooker and his girlfriend, Sherry Maudlin, you know, the one that he calls Butterfingers because she keeps dropping things due to her hyper state of hyperhidrosis. You know, that condition that leads to perpetually moist hands and also her feet. <laughs> Stallone, he's climbing on these rocks. Well, his stunt double's climbing on these rocks. And he finally makes his top to this mountain peak where he finds Michael Rooker and his girlfriend Olive Oil. <laughs> and, but this is the most inept rescue I've ever seen on film. Janine Turner, she lands her helicopter way over there yeah. on a different mountaintop. And then Stallone and Michael Rooker and his greasy-handed girlfriend, they, like, string up this zipline contraption to get them from where they are over to the helicopter. Why wouldn't they just lower a rope or a ladder or a basket? Why have this complicated escape plan? Well, they say something about the wind picking up and that they can't just lower a basket so that they can do this stupid thing. If the wind's picking up, it, it impacts this as much as it does the other thing I just said. I know. I know All it right. does, Chad. And because this movie is fitfully dumb. Um, <laughs> it is. But, but uh, yeah, so S Sylvester Stallone climbs up and it's just like, hey, I guess we're just going to have to wait here until they send over a rope. And so they do. <laughs> And Michael Rooker is like, I will go first. Don't make any time with my girlfriend, Sylvester Stallone. And he's like, hey, I never would. Hey, did he tell you that he hurt his knee coming out of a hot tub? And she's like, he told me it was because he entered it in the war. And he's like, oh, he did, huh? That guy's a goddamn liar. And <laughs> Also, why why are your hands crying? I never seen that much moisture drip off a person's hands before. You know, mate, you just get done washing them or something, huh? Yeah. You know, you... <laughs> your hands are like, hey, hold on to these gloves. For... Oh, hey, oh, look, you dropped them right away. Here, you may want to hang on. To... Oh, yeah, I'll tell you what, I'll just hold on to those for you. You look like you got some form of Pepsi clear stigmata. I don't know what's going on over there. Maybe you got that Tourette's or something, you know, where you just can't hold on to stuff. But he hooks her up to this steel cable running across this cable chasm and he's like all right you just gonna one hand over the other i wouldn't look down or nothing because it's like four thousand feet It'll make you freak out a lot so just keep climbing until you get to michael rooker over there don't worry he's not henry portrait of a serial killer in this movie or nothing so you're gonna be safe and so he kind of just shoves her out on on his line Wee and she starts going, you know, hand over hand, and Michael Rooker is telling her what a great job she's doing, and Stallone is telling her what a good job she's doing. But then the clip that is holding her onto this line starts to break. Uh-huh. And so she kind of comes out of her harness, and she's just holding on to it, screaming for, for dear life. She screams out, Sylvester Stallone, save me! And you're like, wait, you didn't call for Michael Rooker? Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I see where this is going. So, <laughs> cool. And she says earlier, like, are we still on for dinner later? And he's like, yeah, listen, don't tell Janine Turner about that or nothing. I figure maybe, you know, just me and you and Michael Rocco, you know, we'll see what happens. Hey, can I ask you a question? You know how your hands are so greasy and squishy all the time? I heard that your hand jobs kind of feel like blowjobs. You know what? We'll talk about that later, right? She is hanging by this strap. Uh -huh. Please don't let me die! Right. And Michael <laughs> Rooker is like, under no circumstances, circumstances should anybody go 
out and help her. The cable won't hold her! If anyone goes out there, she's gonna die. Hey, I gotta go help her. Please don't let me die! When I get scared, my hands become even extra super moist. Oh. They turn into turgid forms of water. I'm a benevolent Spider-Man villain! You can really just see the water just dripping off of palms as she's hanging on to this thing. I gotta get out there. <laughs> and so he rushes out onto the cable, grabs her right as she's about to fall, uh -huh. and is holding on to her. And as you said, she is just exuding this kind of slug-like slime. <laughs> <laughs> and she ends up slipping out of his grasp and falls to her death. And uh -huh. there's a pretty good Splat. dummy that they throw over the side of this mountain. And <laughs> if you know anything about me, Chad, it's that I love it when somebody throws a dummy out of a high uh -huh. area. Like when the arms have no give. They're yeah. just flopping in the wind. Yeah, I really like that. And this is a pretty good dummy fall. And sure enough, like, but Michael Rooker is like, I can't believe you let my girlfriend die. And Stallone is like, no. And so <laughs> we leave that scene to jump uh -huh. ahead had eight months eight months at the united states treasury in denver colorado Bo. Mm -hmm. not italy <laughs> under any circumstances there's a lot of money being printed and put into these secure looking black boxes with a bunch of made-up hollywood security on these briefcases and here we get our special appearance by special agent paul winfield and special agent dr phil this guy who looks and sounds just like dr phil only a little thinner for sure same mustache same bald head uh -huh. Uh, same level of profanity <laughs> and uh it turns out that paul winfield is like hey we've got this special agent matheson he's going to be mm. transferred to this unit and he's gonna bum a ride with you on this flight and here they kind of give the setup for the story where paul winfield explains that all this currency is, is transported by plane because it's the safest way to transport the money it's nobody can steal the money if it's on a plane right mm -hmm. and travers is like like, yeah, you can come along with me. I don't have any problem with that. Just sit back and enjoy the ride because you're going to be riding up there with about a hundred million dollars. And then Special Agent Dr. Phil says, this is the most protected and useless form of currency known to man. They're all $1,000 bills that are only used for international banking or high stakes poker games between the Illuminati. Every now and again, you might see one of these show up in a rounder situation where you have, say, a john malkovich demanding to show the man his money but in most cases this is just going to be used for high level drug lords sex trafficking you ever see taken it's that kind of currency i haven't lost one bill in 12 years all right don't jinx me now shit where's my wallet boys <laughs> and if you look in the background bo you do see special agent d-day from animal house as played by bruce mcgill he drove the deathmobile that popped and he popped out of that cake in the finale that was pretty good he is such a criminally small part in this because i like bruce mcgill a lot didn't you think he was gonna be fucking shit up the whole movie right, like he like, was gonna be the bad guy or something he, you're, that he's in on it right like you want somebody else on the plane that's in on it well but anyway what do you think of when you think of bruce mcgill uh, like when you see him dude is d-day is that what comes to mind i mean you? mostly you know him doing the throat thing the throat thing yeah when he plays the the william tell overture on his throat and, oh. and then and the, does a as he points at <laughs> flounder i think it is on the stairs <laughs> okay yeah I'd, I'd forgotten that it's I wonderful guess, I, I just when i think about animal house i think about all of the inappropriate uh, misogyny oh sure in the underage sex sure yeah there like that movie is to say it's problematic is underselling how how kind of rotten that movie really is but yeah. you know i grew up with it go to hell shit what was the time travel tv show quantum leap i remember bruce mcgill in the series finale of quantum leap that takes place in a mining town Mm -hmm. and he essentially plays god in that and explains the whole series in the finale that was pretty good yeah he's a very good actor and he's been working for ever you know i like, prefer just to talk about the oeuvre of bruce mcgill please <laughs> than talk about the rest of cliffhanger look we can spend hours on his rizzoli and isles appearances alone <laughs> forget about all the work that he <laughs> did on the television for those patreon like, subscribers that's <laughs> right yeah if, if if you go to our patreon there you'll get the bruce mcgill cast <laughs> 
So we cut to Stallone and he's driving down the snow covered roads of Colorado and we see these two stoner ski board dickheads who notice Stallone and his signature Jeep and these two guys they run up alongside him and they're now taking up two lanes of traffic and then one of the snowboarders screams out oh where you been for the last eight months after you killed that girl with the sweaty hands <laughs> did you ever get an HJ from her I heard they were epic dude and Stone's like hey I was up in Denver you know I was eating omelets <laughs> I was visiting all those uh, locations where they filmed the exterior shots on my favorite tv show mork and mindy hey bro you want to come base jumping with us because <laughs> that's gonna show up later in the movie and he's like oh hey i i really don't have time for that but you better watch out because according to the script there's some bad weather coming in so you may want to watch out for that you know whatever bro righteous later and then they drive off right so <laughs> he shows up at jesse's place he was brushing a horse janine turner yeah hey what are you doing you brushing a horse that's what you look at you doing I always thought they had weird looking penises. I mean, I mean, I know this one ain't excited right now or nothing, but you ever see that? You ever see a horse take a leak? It's really something, Janine Turner. And she gives it one of those like, ha, huh, well, look who's come walking back in. Mm -hmm. A lot of us wanted to leave, but we stayed. You were the only one who left. In his dramatic turn in this movie, he's like, look, you know, Janine Turner, a lot of things really fell apart on that ledge. And she he says, oh yeah? You know, a lot of people fell apart after that, but we all put our shit back together. We didn't go running off to Denver, taking a <laughs> European flight out of Italy. And she's like, look, if you think that your old pal Michael Rooker blames you, and he's like, hey, look, I don't blame him for blaming me. Because, you know, I was the one hanging on to her squishy little hand. It felt like her fingers were dead caterpillars. It was weird. It was like she had coated it in the slime that they use on Nickelodeon or something. And she says, well, have you come back to stay? And he's like, hey, oh, I just, you know, can't really do that. I'm just here to, you know, see if maybe you want to come to Denver with me. And uh, I see you got my dog. I thought maybe I'd take him with me to Denver or something. <laughs> and she's like, look, I've got to go to work and save people people's lives you get your shit from the house and i'll see you never oh okay all right see you later bye bye and then he pets his dog and they're like oh okay sylvester stallone is a good guy according to movie rules right if you like a dog then you're fine as a person cut to a jumbo jet flying in the air filled with all of the special agents and those three cases of money we saw earlier that were talked about and here fbi agent mathis aka agent red herring he's walking around looking all creepy distracted us from the movie's real bad guys and then a smaller jet pulls up beside him and then the movie cuts back over to janine turner arriving at this rock climbing rescue headquarters i don't know what they do are they forest <laughs> rangers or is their job just specific to rescuing people who go rock climbing and kind of fuck up and they need a helicopter zipline save the day i guess you would think that they would be like a forestry service that every now and again we're doing rescue stuff but it seems like they're dedicated to the rescue part right Paul Walton is painting on this pane of glass that's framed in on something that looks like a window that he found on the side of the road. <laughs> and both this painting, it looks like shit. Like, I am no art critic. This looks like a child's finger painting. It's garbage. <laughs> yeah, it, it's the kind of thing that they would use to eventually put Paul Walton in a home. You know, like, <laughs> look at what he did here. He says this is a banana eating a monkey. And, Your Honor, <laughs> I think we can all agree that this is nothing. <laughs> Back up in the skies, the small jet gets close to the treasury plane carrying all of this useless money that's also very important and special agent dr pill says nobody jump to conclusions let me peek out the window and see what's going on maybe it's just a neighbor plane coming over to borrow a cup of sugar or see if our electricity's still on let me take care of this so special agent dr phil he goes up to the the front cabin of the plane he tells the pilot and co-pilot hey fellas uh just drop down to twelve thousand feet barrel roll alpha tank go something like that thanks fellas also you're gonna want to slow down because nothing will shake a, a plane off your tail like <laughs> slowing down he goes into the back of the plane and fbi agent red herring mathis he whips out a small machine gun and says i have jurisdiction over this plane now you two nameless agents in the back can't you see what special agent dr phil is doing he's hijacking the plane and then these two nameless agents they jump up and take FBI agent Mathis's gun and then special agent Dr. Phil he whips out his own gun he kills the FBI agent Mathis he kills the two other special agents then the pilot in the front of the plane shoots the co-pilot 
his head and you're like, oh, these are our two bad guys. Right. Agent Dr. Phil then goes to radio the other plane where we hear British John Lithgow for the first time in this movie. But you don't really know it's him because the accent is so muddled and <laughs> distorted by the radio and the bad accent. It could be anyone of any gender from any age in recorded <laughs> history. And the two planes end up like moving into position and then there's a steel cable that's run between these two planes. Mm -hmm. We do hear a woman's voice mm -hmm. intermixed with Lithgow and she says, Tango Tango, set up the zip line. Tango Tango, the wind is picking up. Tango Tango, set up transfer position. Tango Tango, do the tango. <laughs> Tango Tango, sugar in the gas tank. Honest to God, the number of times that somebody says tango tango in this movie in <laughs> just this scene will make your nose bleed special agent dr phil he sets up a bomb on the plane to explode in five minutes and he says tango tango i'm coming over and then special agent dr phil he hops on this zip line a lot of zip lines in this movie bo mm -hmm. he hops on this zip line and down to the small plane and then everyone on the small plane is wearing this headgear that looks like they're in frogman suits and there's an open window but you can really only see their eyes but not their faces so you don't really know who everybody is yet and then this muddled male accent from some time and place in history which is john lithgow he says what the hell are you doing coming over here before you send the money that wasn't the plan he was to send the money over first we killed special agent dr phil then we escape with the money god damn it see that's why i came over a little bit early is i knew that if you got the money first you mm. wouldn't have as much incentive for me to get on this plane even though i helped you set all this up back on the big plane the pilot makes his way towards the zip line and fbi agent red herring mathis he's not completely dead and he's got just enough life in him to stand up and shoot the pilot with an uzi or a machine gun and the pilot tumbles out the back of the plane and here we see the three cases of money are twisting in the wind attached to this tethered cable and then FBI agent Red Herring Mathis, who first off, he deserves a raid if he wasn't about to die. Because he just starts firing his machine gun at this smaller jet across the way, blowing out the windshield of the cockpit. And then he blasts across these side panels that are marked hydraulic fuel. Yeah, he shoots the <laughs> shit out of this plane. And unfortunately, as you pointed out, there is a charge on the plane, however. And all of a sudden, agent Red Herring realizes that there is now a ball of fire coming towards them from the interior of the plane yeah. and all of that blows up and when that explodes the cases of money that were kind of in between these two planes mm -hmm. they come loose and fall into the mountains below tango tango there goes the money tango tango we have to go get it <laughs> and <laughs> so also the lady pilot crystal is her name in this movie she's like the plane is fucked we're going to have to crash land <laughs> and so they have to land the plane in a model of the mountains which i really like do when this plane lands this little toy model plane that they just like chunk at this little set that crashes <laughs> through tiny little fake trees and blows up like shredded cotton it looks like they're going down in the land of the lost <laughs> tango 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 i see a sleet stack and so the plane kind of breaks up it almost goes over the mountain but it, it slows to a stop at which point the movie decides to show us the two knuckleheads we saw in the jeep earlier uh-huh doing a base jump just to remind us that they're in the movie so when they show up later we're like oh yeah those guys it's not a base jump they jump off a cliff on a sound stage and then the movie shows us footage of two guys leaping out of an airplane <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's just silly man it doesn't even the continuity like, it's bonkers and i know we crap on movies all the time but just watching this it's like this feels intentionally bad at times yeah and keep in mind this was edited so that it didn't look as much like garbage so eh. the actress who plays that female jet pilot in the movie i don't know her name but she also played emile schindler wife of oscar schindler and steven spielberg's iconic film schindler's list and that movie came out the same year that cliffhanger was released in theaters tango tango I wonder which one she had at the top of her resume. <laughs> uh, but sure enough, back at the plane, the co-pilot is now dead. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know, we're on a sound stage now where you get a full size replica of that toy plane. Yeah. And the toy plane came to rest on the edge of a cliff, but when you see the full size plane, it's nowhere near a cliff. I expected Pee Wee Herman to ride by on his bike in the background. Right. It's one of those things of like there's a dog poised at the back of the plane <laughs> that they have to keep from walking towards them or whatever, so it doesn't go over the cliff side. <laughs> but uh instead, John Lithgow points a gun at at Travers, our agent Dr. Dr. Phil. Phil. Yeah. And you bastard. <laughs> which he calls like two or three people a bastard a couple of times in this movie it really does my heart good you said you thought of everything didn't you special agent dr phil everything except for what's happening now which means you didn't think of everything you bastard all right well look you and i we're partners okay we're gonna work together i got this tracking monitor right here and <laughs> you're gonna need me because only i know the codes to it and there's about fifty thousand code variations so <laughs> it's best if you don't shoot me and also this device it shows you the latitude longitude and altitude of the three cases that fell out of the plane now i don't know why these cases have this type of trafficking device or why there would be a handheld computer that would identify them in such a location i didn't write the screenplay but what i do know is i've got the codes and you need me so unless you slept through that crash landing you need me if you want to get that money that's worthless and you're probably going to need it to get out of the country and Let's be honest, this screenplay is really sloppy with its details. So under the instruction of John Lithgow, this pilot, Crystal, radios the the knuckleheads back at the rescue station for help. Mm -hmm. And she says, yeah, we're a bunch of hikers and we got lost in a snowstorm. Please send a helicopter fast because there's uh, somebody here that needs insulin. And they're all mm -hmm. out because of us being lost in the storm, I think. Tango, tango. So when she hangs up, John Lithgow go is so pleased with this performance and he's like hmm insolent i bet you wouldn't have thought of that would you have agent dr phil you bastard and then it turns out though that back at the rescue station they can't actually send a helicopter because of this storm coming in uh-huh and so michael rooker is like i tell you what i'll go up there and see what's going on i'll bring him back you can't fly a helicopter it'd probably be faster if i walk <laughs> what yeah yeah <laughs> you, know, you would think that they would have sled dogs or something just anything faster than walking but all mm -hmm. right a snowmobile perhaps whatever anyway stallone who has not been in our movie very much at all he's moping around janine turner's place in the rain and she shows up in her ford pickup and she pops out and she says thank god you're still in the movie sylvester stallone we just got a call back at the ranger station where it's snowing really heavy even though it's not snowing here we need you to go help some stranded hikers who need insulin i think they said his name was mike what was his last name hunt yeah they said <laughs> wait no his last name was Roch. that was it you gotta go save him and stone's like uh, you, you know michael rooker he's a good climber you could go save him like his you know he, he never dropped no bodies with hands me vaseline and salt and butter you know not like me you know when she tries to convince him to go up to help michael rooker help these people he's like Look, I just haven't climbed in so long. You just lose the feel for these things. Plus, I think that lady gave me some kind of gooey infection on my hands. They're all slippery. I, got, I think I got what she got. And, <laughs> oh yeah, I think you've just lost your nerve. And he says, look, I came back here for you and the dog and maybe some of my <laughs> stuff. I don't care about climbing rocks and helping people. All right, Gabe, if you leave, you're going to be stuck on that ledge the rest of your life. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but someday in the what are we talking about we cut from that drama to mm. uh the treasury back in denver where a bunch uh -huh. of the agents are like holy shit this plane went down and we can't go searching for it right away because of this big weather front moving in and then is that why they, oh, okay. yeah that's what they say and then a all bunch right. of fbi agents roll up and are like all right listen here's the deal that uh agent red herring that we sent on the plane for you he wasn't just <laughs> along for the ride like we said we were fooling you you he was oh! he was investigating agent dr phil because we think that that guy was in cahoots with this other dude named eric quaylen aka john lithgow who was uh -huh. a former military intelligence operative who's flipped what? What? and he's been plotting to hijack one of these treasury shipments and oh! even though all these bills are in these giant denominations yeah it wouldn't have value for the most people no uh, john lithgow has the international connections uh to basically fence all of these stolen bills profitably oh shit and then they show him the picture like and here is 
the man we're talking about and sure enough it's john lithgow and the bad guy from the second plane that has hijacked all this money yeah and so i don't know necessarily why we need this you don't but you don't need any of this but yeah anyway this is this movie is has a very fast sloppy script it, there's so many loose ends that never get addressed we cut to stallone and he's sitting up on this ledge of a mountain as michael rooker claws his way to the top to join him and michael rooker says what the hell are you doing up here keep in mind michael rooker hasn't seen sylvester stallone for eight months to the best of our knowledge yeah not since the few Funeral. this would be shocking it would be like if i walked into the bathroom of my house and you were just sitting there like what the hell but i had also been a participant in the death of your dog <laughs> and we had not seen each other or spoken since that dog was buried and then i'm just there and you're like well what are you doing here <laughs> <laughs> Stallone says, uh, Hey, Michael Rook, Janine Turner filled me in, yeah? She says you got some missing hikers. One of them needs some insulin. She said his last name was, what was it, Ockhurts? First name was Mike. I think that was it, right? And Rooker is like, Look, I don't need your help. And ends up like grabbing him and is like, Look, we did things that day on the ledge and it fucked up. You murdered my girlfriend that I wasn't close enough to to tell the truth about how I hurt my leg. And so I'm going to hold you over this this precipice and maybe throw you off and stallone does one of those like go ahead do it i don't care you'd like that wouldn't you you'd like me to throw you off you didn't have to explain to her family why i was the one who convinced her to go rock climbing over a mile up in the sky and then i got hurt and we couldn't get back to the ground and now that i say it out loud i'm probably more responsible for her death than you but i'm still angry at you dude michael rooker has an amazing line delivery here where stallone says look man it was a bad time and Michael Rooker says, what the hell do you know about bad times, man? Oh, it's good. <laughs> it is quality, Michael Rooker. Look, you want to throw me off the cliff? Throw me off the cliff, all right? And he's like, no, you're going to live with it. Yeah. And then we end that scene. Yeah. So they climb up, uh, apparently, with nothing settled that I could tell. Yeah. Two professional rock climbers pretending to be Michael Rooker and Sylvester Stallone make their way up the side of this cliff. Well, in fairness, Michael Rooker has a more human form that's easier to imitate. <laughs> We do see a henchman who is Max Dad from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, who we last saw on Pick 6 Movies doing backflips and stealing a baby for the Penguin in Batman Returns. This is a real family reunion of Pick 6 movie alumni, Bo. Yeah, it, it's nice to see everybody back and having a good time in yet another <laughs> terrible movie. Henchman Max Dad, he looks over with this other henchman and he sees our two rescue rangers creeping their way up to the top of the mountain. And then we immediately just cut to Sylvester Stallone and Michael rooker being walked at gunpoint towards the plane crash yeah and you're like how did we go from there to okay it's on the editing room floor somewhere and you can just leave it there so michael rooker and stallone tell the bad guys essentially like hey we can't bring a chopper in here on account of the bad weather in the screenplay so i guess we're just gonna have to you know walk and dr phil says all right i'll tell you what how about you tell me your names because that's the way people get close it forms intimacy and bonding so <laughs> like my name is agent dr phil what are your names and so they tell them you know their names and dr phil says all right listen sylvester stallone and michael rooker we're missing three bags filled with money they got tracking devices on them and i'm gonna need one or both of you to track down these cases and bring them to us Hey, let me ask you a question in those bags you're looking for. Is there any insulin? Because there's a guy, what was his name? Uh, last name, Hunt Stinks. First name, Mike. You ever heard of him? He needs insulin real bad. He gave us a call a little earlier. If you got some insulin. And then Special Agent Dr. Phil says, look, fellas, it's none of your fucking business was in those bags. And you're like, whoa, <laughs> whoa. Where'd that come from? He's got a bit of a, a hair trigger temper. Yeah, he's the dad of that kid you never wanted to go visit because you never knew when shit was going to pop off. Like, it might be yeah. cool, but he also might just start loading a gun or just chunking around cookware. What do you mean we're not having lasagna tonight? I specifically <laughs> said I wanted lasagna when I got home. <laughs> Who are these little bastards? Are these some friends of my kid? They look as shitty as he does. How about you get them 
Run the fuck out of my house and find me some lasagna. <laughs> it's like watching home movies from my youth. I know, right? John Lithgow chimes in. Well, since you asked, these cases contain suits, socks, and $100 million, the usual stuff. They try to give him some one-liners in this movie that never come off. Uh-huh. And his character, like John Lithgow, as I mentioned in, in the introduction, a fantastic actor, a consummate professional. He's grossly underused in this nothing to do in this movie Uh -uh. Lithgow does say here gentlemen the writers of the screenplay were clever enough to put tracking devices on these three cases as has been informed to me by special agent Dr. Phil here and special agent Dr. Phil says don't use my name god damn it use your code names I'm Foxworthy you're Farquaad we discussed this shit earlier come on man everybody have that we're using code names you (laughs) bastards Lithgow says look at this little computer device it's quite ingenious see these three red dots each dot represents represents one of the cases that we're looking for. The ones that I mentioned that were filled of suits and socks and all of this money. Do you gentlemen recognize the locations? If you say no, then you're worthless and you'll be discarded. Isn't that right, Special Agent Dr. Phil? I mean, Foxworthy. Man, Dr. Phil has this real like, how about you get off my back moment? He, his exact line is, get off my back, motherfucker. And Lithgow says, off your back. I haven't even gotten on it. Sylvester Slow, Michael Rooker, do you recognize the locations of the cases? You see the remainder of our movie will be spent pursuing and retrieving these cases filled with suits, socks, and the aforementioned $100 million. So off they go to find these cases. Uh And they reach a point as they're climbing along this rock face, like a ledge. The rest of this movie might as well be that sequence in Fellowship of the Ring where they're going through the mountains and just kind of back to the wall scooting along the side of rocks and stuff. Dude, these people just survived a plane crash, Bo. They're getting ready to, like, traipse across the the snowy alps performing feats of physical aptitude of upper body strength that most humans do not possess well yeah because it's all nonsense we but find the first case but it's up on a mountaintop i like the fact that lithgow has a good all right you're going to climb up there you and he points at stallone and then he goes fetch (laughs) it's pretty good and meanwhile we hear that janine turner is kind of radioing like hey where are you guys i i sent you out walking into the middle of a snowstorm in the mountains surely you you can hear me and stallone is sent up to get this case but they tie a rope to him first or they make michael rooker tie a rope to him but can't he just untie that rope that's on his ankle when he gets up to the top we'll get to that in a second but (laughs) they also take his coat i guess that the theory being you've got to come down if you a we've got a rope tied to you that when we can yank you down and also if you don't have a coat you're going to freeze to death if you try to take off on your own yeah that was dr phil's idea by the way he's like take his coat for insurance get his pants off of him as escrow his (laughs) shoes are the security deposit and dr phil also gives him a well you heard the man fetch yeah. fetch motherfucker michael rooker's tying the rope to him and michael rooker says if you get up there and you can get away do it i'll jump off the side of the mountain and kill myself so i can be with my dead girlfriend remember the one you killed when you let her self-lotioning hand slip through your incompetent fingers <laughs> stallone <laughs> says would you yeah i get the fuck out of here <laughs> well you know i'm kind of a different guy also i really need to circle back around to the fact that you have really greasy hands i mean that's something that you probably knew yeah. one of the reasons you were probably dating her i don't blame you for that but i was trying to put a ring on that finger but it kept slipping off honestly it was like squeezing pudding <laughs> so still he makes his way up the side of this mountain and he quickly reaches the top and he finds the case it's covered in snow and he starts banging it with a rock and it pops open and reveals these thousand dollar bills down below john lithgow says you know i don't think we need two guides retire him when he comes down and michael rooker hears this and he just shouts out hey sylvester stallone they're gonna do to you what you did to my girlfriend eight months ago and by that i mean they're gonna kill you and lithgow says pull the rope pull the rope and we get a thrilling scene of two-on-one tug of war involving (laughs) stallone up on this snowbank and a couple of lackeys down below and rather than just untie the rope cuts it with some climbing equipment that's strapped to his back i don't know where that came from yeah i thought they had cleared it off because they told him before he went up that they were going to take all of his climbing gear right but apparently not that and also to your point earlier why not just untie it at this point (laughs) 
<laughs> but instead, he just has to whack it a few times and grunt at it until he cuts through the rope. At which point, Lithgow's men start shooting up at him. Yeah, like guns and grenades. <laughs> creating an avalanche. And so Stallone just throws this case uh -huh. into the avalanche where it pops open and all the bills go spilling down the side of the mountain along with the snow right so we're down to 66 million dollars that's the the purse now and lithgow tells rooker well your friend just had the most expensive funeral in history that best it's not even close to the most expensive funeral ever ronald reagan's funeral reportedly cost 400 million dollars it was like this seven day affair in california and dc remember it was like a national day of mourning everybody got the day off of work and what about liberace i bet that was pricey more than 33 million i would janine turner pipe in on the radio hey where are you guys and lithgow looks at michael rooker and he says here yeah, talk to the woman no messages or secret codes and these guys have got to be some of the dumbest criminal masterminds ever captured on film just don't answer she yeah. doesn't know who they are where they are what they're doing she's not a cop she's just some rando on the horn looking for an update who can fly a helicopter for all she knows everybody's dead in the snowstorm and rooker gets on the horn with her and he's like yeah there's no one in, at the tower don't send a chopper or anything talk to you later uh you break it up and once the line is disconnected janine turner is like huh he said he was at the tower why would he be there you know what paul walton how about you take me up in that chopper that we couldn't use because of the weather and <laughs> drop me off in the middle of nowhere with the rest of them how does that sound <laughs> He's like, well, I was going to paint a mango eating a Sasquatch, but I guess. <laughs> the bad guys, they make their way through the snow. And the computer shows that missing case two of three is up on the top of some other mountain peak. We cut over to Stallone and he's climbing up the face of this rock. And it pans out to reveal that the mountain he is going up is the size of an Imperial Star Destroyer. <laughs> it is so stupid big while he's climbing that and the bad guys are looking for the cases uh janine turner gets dropped off in that same gully where they filmed that first sasquatch video that got so popular uh -huh. <laughs> and then stallone ends up making it to this shanty where janine turner finds him there's a whole lot of serendipitous coincidence that the place she goes is where he is right and she's like oh my god why aren't you wearing any clothes and showing off those big muscles and reminding me why it was we were together in the first place holy god they did date for a while right i i think so i thought they were like he's got a wedding ring on really and i i don't know that they're married it, again this screenplay does not go out of its way to establish characters and or their right. relationships but anyway she smashes this case and here she pulls out the moth eaten sweater from die hard 2 and he puts that on and then they kind of pick up some equipment like a rope and like a stick with a rock on it to make a hammer or something yeah and he fills her in on the heist it turns out the the guy who needed insulin freely first name ip um <laughs> turns out he didn't need insulin at all he didn't even exist it, turned, it was a bunch of bank robbers and they got michael roca and also that lady from schindler's list <laughs> And he basically says, we need to get to that next case before they do so we can trade for Michael Roker. And maybe that lady from Schindler's List, she seemed okay. The bad guys are walking along and Special Agent Dr. Phil says, hey, the case, it's just right up there on that ledge. And Leon, one of our bad guys, he says, it better be. And Dr. Phil turns around and says, I'm starting to get real fucking tired of these threats. And I'm like, is it better be a threat? That's pretty low on the scale of threatening things one can say. Again, proving that dr phil has an insanely short fuse in this movie and it's just itching for a fight from anybody somehow stallone and janine turner beat our bad guys to the second case how do they know where it is don't worry about it when they arrive the case is busted <laughs> open with money blown hither and yon and janine turner says what do we do now and stallone says you got a pencil like why would she have a pencil maybe she has a quill and some ink you got one of them uh like personal data assistants like uh steven seagal did in that train movie or something because <laughs> uh, why would I have that? All right, well, look, I'm just asking some questions. You can just say no. You don't have to get snippy about Our it. bad guys show up. And Stallone and Janine Turner have taken time to build a snowman. <laughs> 
the, it looks like a miniature albino grimace and the money case is in front of it and special agent dr phil he opens it up the case and inside is a single thousand dollar bill remember you can't use this as a form of currency in normal circulation and written on the bill is want to trade do yeah. they think that sylvester stallone wrote this message i mean for all practical purposes he died in the avalanche earlier I guess they think that he survived at this point because uh, Lithgow is like, it must be that bastard. Yeah. This is the equivalent to John McClane writing, what was it? Merry Christmas. Now I've got a gun or something. Yeah. I have a machine gun now. Ho, ho, ho. Yeah. Um, and they realize that night is falling. Uh -oh. And and so they're going to send out uh, this dude that's got some night vision goggles. Yeah. Max dad from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah. So he goes searching for that Sylvester bastard. Stallone and Jeannie Turner <laughs> and spots them. And so uh -huh. he starts to shoot at them and, and, and runs after them. And he comes up on a, this snow drift and he's about to fire down to kill Sylvester Stallone and Janine Turner. But Sylvester Stallone has gotten a flare from where? Never mind. Okay. From Janine Turner. She apparently had one. Okay. Or they got like, it from the little gift shop. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Along with a pencil sharpener <laughs> and <laughs> some astronaut ice cream. <laughs> A coffee yeah. mug, a little license plate for the back of your bike. It's a sly. I had to take it. I mean, everywhere I go, nobody has my name, and they did. <laughs> so, you know, I feel kind of obligated. And he he pulls the cap on the flare, and it blinds this dude. Yeah. And so the two end up wrestling in the snow and start sliding down this long slope. Yeah, Stallone is riding Max's dad like a child snow toboggan. Like, he's on top of him treating this other human as a sled. And then somehow they trade places through punching. And then first, Max's dad jumps on Stallone and rides Stallone like a snow toboggan. Then they yeah. punch and switch places. And then Stallone rides Max's dad like a sled and he mashes his face into the snow and it grinds up his face like hamburger at the last second they realize like oh we're about to go over a cliff uh oh and so stallone uses one of his rock climbing things i think it's his ice axe to anchor himself while max dad goes barreling over the edge yeah. oh at which point Michael Rooker, who has seen all of this go down uh -huh. along with the rest of the bad guys, says, well, gravity's a bitch, ain't yeah. it? And there's this Irish henchman with him who we haven't really met yet. He just goes, hi to toy, fuck the money, and fuck you, I don't want to die in this mountain. And then his tirade goes on to the point where he looks over at Leon, the only black member of the group, and he calls him boy, which rightfully so, Leon takes issue with and threatens to kill this racist Irish guy. The temperature in the room needs to go down a few degrees, so Lithgow steps in and says, gentlemen, Gentlemen, the fight's not here. It's down there. Go find us some shelter. I'm like, I don't know what Lithgow expects these henchmen who just survived a plane crash to do regarding shelter for five or six adults at night on top of a mountain, unless shelter is code for a place to curl up and die of hypothermia. <laughs> so he sends them off to look for, I guess, a, a similar shanty to the one that Stallone found. There's a quick cutaway scene to our stoner knuckleheads uh -huh. in a tent complaining about the fact that they did not listen to the advice of Stallone and went up on this mountain and got stuck there. Right. Again, the movie just reminding us that they are still there. Yeah. And then our bad guys do in fact discover that shanty and realize that Stallone now has a bunch of climbing equipment. They were here. I can tell. I can smell him. I smell his axe body spray and hints of pickle juice. I don't know why that's what he has on, but, it, but that's what he has on. He just likes deli pickles. That's all. <laughs> and Lithgow is like, well, it seems like your friend, that bastard, is one step ahead of us again. And Rooker says, he ain't my friend. I don't like him. I don't like you. I got nothing against that lady over there. She seems nice. Just also, I don't like black licorice or root beer or the sounds of auctioneers talking fast. It makes me anxious for some reason. Look, all I know for sure is that you're a messy bitch who loves drama. I want no piece of it. We have to find that money. We cut to Stallone and he is burning the money from the case to make a fire. And he's there with Janine Turner and he quips, hey, it costs a fortune to heat this place. I said that because I'm burning money. It costs a whole lot of money. Keep us warm. 
Yeah, and then they just curl up and go to sleep. It's weird that the movie comments on how bad the jokes are in this movie. You know, just because you're aware of it doesn't make it better. The next morning, Pa Walton, he gets on the radio and he calls out, Rescue! Units! Come in! What the hell's going on out there? And we cut away from that. We see our bad guys marching Michael Rooker towards the third case of money. I don't know what their plan is after they get the money. I guess they're going to buy their way out of this somehow. They're on a mountain! They got nothing, but... Okay, Lithgow says, how much further is it, you bastard? And immediately, Dr. Phil puts Michael Rooker in a chokehold and screams, He said how much further, goddammit! And I'm like, (laughs) dude, you know that Special Agent Dr. Phil is that guy who just habitually puts his hand on the horn of his car at a red light, just waiting for it to turn green so he can voice his displeasure at the first car in line not moving fast enough. Look, some of us have places to be, (laughs) goddammit. Just because you're looking down at your phone, probably changing to a different podcast, afraid that Pick Six Movies ain't going to update. You're going to end up having to listen to an old episode like Silver Bullet or something, which is pretty good, but you've heard it four times already. <laughs> How about you hit one of the pedals and maybe one on means go, motherfucker? Michael Rooker chokes out, it's half a day. So we come back to our two doped up snowboarders and they're marching over this snowbank with this, whoa, dude, it's Michael Rooker. He got a stink palm in Kevin Smith's mall rats and licked chocolate shit off his fingers. Right, and then michael rooker screams out run man go you need to get out of here and they're like oh shit it's the cops they know it got weed so they take <laughs> off running and leon immediately shoots one of the snowboarders and then leon and special agent dr phil they give chase after the other snowboarder again they just kill him for no reason and then the blonde jet pilot she pistol whips michael rooker I'm like i bet he doesn't like her now what's his name max perlick I think is, is anyway, he's been in a bunch of stuff. He makes he it always away. looks like he should be a reporter for a newspaper in the 40s or something. Yes. And he manages to get his parachute on as he's running away from these people uh-huh. and jumps off the ledge, at which point Michael Rooker says, you didn't have to kill them kids. And Lithgow, for no reason that I can discern, says, sue me, you bastard. And I'm like, for killing them or i uh why did he say that he does also say you kill a few people and you're a murderer kill millions of people and you're a conqueror go figure where are you going with all of this right none of it adds up to what is happening in this movie but sure enough this stoner kid ends up pulling his chute and like lands in a tree and it's all very unthrilling completely unexciting also they have at best like 35 million bucks that they're tracking down which that's a lot of money but it's not super villain money you know not at this point stallone got paid like a third or half of that and he's barely even in this film man he does so little we haven't talked about the fact that at this point in the movie all he has managed to do chad is drop a woman drop a woman throw a couple of cases off the mountain and manage to get to some form of shelter while being very cold our crew marches to go get the last case of money also time check we are an hour into this movie we got 45 minutes left but again don't worry we're gonna get through this real fast stallone and janine turner they find the bad guys up on a ridge and stallone sees a split in the rocks and he says hey we need to go through that crack which is what they do (laughs) oh over with team bad guys special agent dr phil he's all covered in sweat and he says hey to hell with all the money just call the helicopter i want to get out of here and lithgow says no 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 we're in bed now partners in crime you bastard we're joined at the hip you've crossed over there's no crossing back and then we get more walking more lord of the rings more walking on mountains then we finally get inside the crack chad Uh (laughs) and and stallone is following janine turner and puts his hand down in what appears at first glance to be just mud or something Uh and he goes oh uh oh uh hey janine turner i don't want you to freak out or nothing but let's just back slowly out of this cave and she's like why would we do that i hope you don't mind that i'm talking very loud it'd be best if you kept your voice down don't make so much noise all right dude she ends up looking up to see a bunch of bats Uh above her head and she loses her shit Uh bats fly everywhere which turns them into vigilantes fighting crime (laughs) in gotham wearing a cape and a cow i just don't understand why it's so fright like i i guess it's because they're bats but also like kind of 
so what? Yeah. Especially for a forest ranger, unless that's her phobia, which t- tell us that early on that she hates bats. Then you're like, uh oh, there's a lot of bats in here. Well, I couldn't believe I, I know that you hate bats a whole lot, but there's a bunch in here. I don't understand what the, the real threat of this is. Yeah. Other than they're flying around and then they all leave. End of scene. Yeah. Paul Walton, he goes down and gets in the helicopter to go find his co-workers so they can come back and critique his newest shitty painting. He gets a signal on this thermal imaging something that the movie made up so that he can find people. And he sees the snowboarder who jumped off the ledge and crashed in the tree. He's now hanging there with blood dripping off his legs. And then a bunch of wolves that are being portrayed by Alaskan Huskies show up to kind of <laughs> nibble at his toes. And then Paul Walton, he comes around the court. He fires his gun kapow kapow and then all the huskies run away and then paul walton cuts down the snowboarder so thank god they tied up that loose end bow because we didn't need to know what happened to that character he says later he sent him to the hospital or something but all right it's a real whole lot of nothing chat <laughs> so meanwhile back in the crack he, uh-huh. sylvester stallone is climbing up that crack uh-huh. we see that he's almost at the top we get a cutaway to michael rooker and the bad guys crossing this rope bridge yeah it's straight out of t- Temple of Doom. Rooker's yeah. like, see, Dr. Phil, it's safe. Very strong bridge. Very strong bridge. Crack. Not funny. And John Lithgow says, Leon, come here a moment. I want you to find that bastard Sylvester Stallone and get my money <laughs> and so leon is now on the case we get a cutaway here to paul winfield uh, to let us know that he and his team are now up in this helicopter looking for the wreckage and the money and they uh, get a radio report that's like hey paul winfield <laughs> Tango, tango, we just <laughs> found a wreckage of this airplane a hundred miles south, southwest of the entrance to the park. And he's like, great. How many more scenes do I have in this movie? Uh, you've only got me for the day, everyone. Stallone does a little fake rock climbing on a green screen as he tries to reach the top of the crack. Leon is at the tippy top of this mountain. And by a real coincidence, Bo, something that happens a lot in this movie, he's standing right beside this hole that Sylvester Stallone pops out of and then leon just pulls a gun on stallone and he says your life is on sale the price is 30 million dollars where is it and stallone says it's gone i burned it i could never save anything (laughs) and then (laughs) stallone whips up his ice axe and splits open leon's shin stallone tumbles back down the crack to the ground below and leon ever the trooper just sprays bullets down into this bat cave crack so lithgow hears these gunshots and he tells his blonde pilot friend get the c4 they have c4 bastards up yeah apparently (laughs) so and so he radios leon he's like you bastard get out of there (laughs) and leon's like Fuck that. I'm going to kill Sylvester Stallone because I'm invested at this point on account of me calling Janine Turner his bitch a bunch of times. Yeah, it's real inappropriate. And so he chases Stallone down into the crack. Right. And then (laughs) Janine Turner kicks him in the face yeah she kicks leon straight in the head but then he he bitch slaps her with this gun and then we get a fight between stallone and leon and it's a lot of body blow bloody blow uppercut uppercut and janine turner runs over and picks up the gun that leon had she pulls the trigger and it goes click and then leon says no bullets bitch which i'm like why are you carrying a gun that has no bullets in it he also chad has this really fancy knife that he has whipped out oh that's a mick dundee brand knife bow i'm gonna cut you and if you're lucky i won't hurt your bitch and they fight some more stallone gets roughed up some yeah it's like round nine of a rocky movie he's on his knees he's splitting blood his eyes all puffy at that point he's about to like stab stallone and stallone is like you hit like a sissy and he's like what'd you say and he says i said you hit like a sissy and then stallone just grabs this dude Uh lifts him over his his head yep. like it's professional wrestling yep. and jams him up onto a stalactite yep. thereby killing leon yeah r.i.p leon yeah yeah we hardly knew you leon mm. and so 
after Janine Turner has witnessed her boyfriend slash husband slash stranger murder this guy wantonly, they hear Frank, aka Paul Walton, radioing them. Yeah. And they realize like, oh, this dude Leon had a radio and we're trying to get to it, but it's fallen into uh, this like nook in the rocks that they I would can't call reach. it a smaller crack in the big crack. <laughs> a a sub crack, if you will. He's like, no, hey, hey, Janine Turner, we gotta get this radio. That's what you do in the Die Hard movie. You get a radio. They did it in Die Hard. They did it in Die Hard 2. They did it in Under Siege 2. They probably did it in Speed 2, but I don't remember that movie too well. I know I just watched it, but that movie just is like water off a duck's back or like hanging on to that lady's hand. just slips right through. The blonde jet pilot lady, she arms the C4 with a timer for five minutes. That's the standard villain timer in this movie. And she places it above this Batcave crack. And then Stallone, who's still down in the crack, he runs over and he finds, I think it's another gun or something attached to Leon's belt, or maybe it's his rock gun. It, it's it's a bit confusing. Yeah, I, I think it's his rock gun is the thing. Okay. Which I also don't understand why he has if earlier in the movie they stripped him of, of all his gear. Right. Maybe that's just where they hid it from him. But he found it. Yeah. Lithgow and the blonde jet pilot, they make their way across the Temple of Doom bridge and Michael Rooker, he grabs the radio from one of the bad guy's belts and he runs back across the bridge screaming, Sylvester Lowe, Sylvester Lowe, there's a bomb above your head. Get the hell out of here. Which I wanted to know, did someone watching this movie sneak into the movie and tell Michael Rooker that Sylvester Stallone has a walkie talkie now? Why would he assume that? <laughs> or maybe that Leon was still down there and it would just go off on his belt or whatever. But anyway, it's time to do a real Uncharted in this movie. Uh huh. Where Sylvester Stallone and Janine Turner rig up this old rope, uh -huh. which they are going to use to drop down and do this wall run and repel essentially around the edge of this mountain to another crook, another mm -hmm. crack in the mountain. Yeah. But it's an old rope, Bo. Yep. And it's starting to fray. Yep. And sure enough, snap, uh, it breaks, but Stallone is, makes it to the ledge. And then it's Janine Turner who starts to fall and he grabs her and he's like, oh boy, this is just like what happened at the beginning of the movie. I hope you don't have slippery fingers. Hey, your fingers are like Velcro or something. Do you really <laughs> hang on? And sure enough, he pulls her up onto the ledge and I guess we have resolved the emotional crux of the story now. Now? In about 11 seconds, that's gone. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, because the world explodes. But they hide in a crook on the wall and they're fine. Yeah. So, yeah, good for them, I guess. <laughs> Paul Walton shows up in the helicopter and he sees the blonde jet pilot lady laying in the snow with a red flare blowing smoke. So he lands the helicopter, but off to the side, John Lithgow and special agent Dr. Phil, they have Michael Rooker pinned down with a gun to his head so he can't alert Paul Walton to his impending doom. And then Paul Walton approaches the blonde lady pilot and as he gets closer to her, her eyes pop open like a serial killer. And mm -hmm. then she grabs Paul Walton's gun and then that Irish goon, who's pretty racist, Racist, he shows up and then Michael Rooker runs over the stow bank screaming, Paul Walt, Paul Walt is trapped. And then things just go in slow motion and this racist Irish goon shoots Paul Walton with a machine gun. Something I never thought I would see captured on film. And here it is, Bo. A terrorist killing Paul Walton. Yep. Uh -huh. And he gets gunned down. Michael Rooker like rushes to him, cradles him in his arms as Paul Walton dies. And the one thing he gets out of this, other than, you know, trauma, is he finds Frank's <laughs> knife, uh, Paul Walton's knife, kind of tucked down in his boot or whatever. And yeah. he kind of gets that. And he's like, I will use this later to avenge you, Paul Walton. And cradles <laughs> this guy's dying body as Paul Walton coughs up blood and, you know, slithers off this mortal coil. We cut back to the Temple of Doom bridge where Stallone and Janine Turner, they do -si do their way across the shaky planks. And then Stallone trips a wire and the bridge blows up no, 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 on the Janine far side. Turner who fucks this up stallone does not he's the hero chad he's not gonna trip it it was janine i Turner. thought he trips the wire and he's like run the other way <laughs> somebody tripped on something no, it was her but yeah it blows again it's a very temple of doom of oh we gotta hurry up and get to the other end and at this point after they have cut off uh stallone and janine turner dr phil is like you know what how about we just take this old coots helicopter and go find this third case and then we'll just get the hell out of here how about we, we do that a 
mean, apparently this storm isn't keeping any, any helicopters grounded for shit. You bastard. Don't you realize your plan is completely idiotic? We don't have enough gas to go look for the case and do whatever that other thing you said you wanted to do. How about you give me that tracking device, you bastard? And Dr. Phil is like, yeah, all right, here, take it. You can have it. Hey, man, don't you realize that after John Lithgow finds that money, you're going to be as dead as me? Oh, Michael Rooker, you're not dead yet. Oh, I'll see what you mean. But look, John Lithgow, that computer I threw you, it's got all these secret locations and passwords and 50,000 key codes that change every 15 minutes or some bullshit the screenwriter made up. And somehow I'm the only one who knows how to do it. So you kill me, you don't get Get your money. At this point, Lithgow, who, as we pointed out, has nothing to do in this movie, has kind of the most interesting moment where he does a, a good villain move, where he's like, you know what, Travis? You're right. And the, I know. The one thing that we need is a pilot. Yeah, that's what you got that pretty lady there for. Hmm. Interesting that you say that. And then he kind of leans into the crook of this lady's neck, Lipko does, and he says, do you know what the true meaning of love is? Sacrifice. Never saying I'm sorry? No, no, no. That's love story. This is a different thing. Anyway, I'm just proving a point. Sorry about this. And then he shoots her from behind, murdering her. And <laughs> Dr. Phil's like, holy shit shit well <laughs> all right i guess you're the only person who can fly that helicopter now so we're really partners now hey don't tell john lithgow but i can fly the helicopter too probably i mean i've never done it but i've seen paul walton do it i've seen janine turner do it i played a lot of zaxxon back in my day it can't be that hard i played a lot of zaxxon i was really good at them tron games <laughs> they have kind of the same stick <laughs> As Dr. Phil and Michael Rooker and the racist Irish guy are the only people left besides Lithgow. And Lithgow is just like, I'm going to stay here in this helicopter, you bastards. Go get my money. <laughs> And so th the rest of the group all takes off while Stallone also is getting rid of all the dead weight by sending Jenny Turner back for help. And he sets off to find this last container. You go get help and I'll go save Michael Rooker. Maybe. That sounds like a good plan. Or maybe I won't. Honestly, I didn't read this far into the script before I said yes. I'm not sure how this is going to end up. Boy, I hope I win. Stallone wanders across this ledge on the side of the mountain and he comes to a ladder so that the movie can explain how Stallone is able to quickly scale the side of this mountain to get to the finale of the film. There's a lot of ladders in this movie, Bo, <laughs> for a movie about rock climbing. <laughs> and <laughs> he climbs this ladder, and sure enough, there is the case. Hey, this is amazing. I found all three of them really fast. Maybe I could have a second career finding cases. Oh, maybe I should be a criminal. You know, that'd be an interesting <laughs> term for this movie. Hang on a second. Flip, flip, flip. Oh, no, I'm the hero. Okay, never mind. And so... He stuffs his backpack full of the money. Uh -huh. Worthless money. Yes. And here's this beep, beep, beep. Is that a bomb? Is the microwave going off? Is that my pacemaker? Somebody backing up a truck? Some better, better not be microwaving fish in the office, because that stinks to high heaven. You know who does that? Paul Walton. Uh, next time I see him, I'm going to kill that guy. But it turns out it's the, the sound of the tracker coming from this hole, which we'll play out here in a moment, as Dr. Phil realizes that he's getting closer by the tracker that he's got, and he tells Michael Rooker, like, hey, I think I can find this case from here, because it's only about 25 feet away so uh <laughs> hey racist irish guy if you want to go ahead and kill him go on and you can do it but do it kind of quiet right so i'm gonna go get this case you take care of michael rooker i'll see you later this racist irish goon walks over to michael rooker and rooker starts taking off his clothes and then there's this back and forth insult that ultimately leads to them going bare knuckle brawl and then the irish goon just starts beating the shit out of michael rooker why he doesn't shoot him i don't know but this whole ad ass kicking is peppered with this goon talking about how much he likes soccer and how good a soccer player he is and he kicks michael rooker in the head and it's it, nonsense i man. think he breaks michael rooker's leg or his knee or something but that doesn't really matter later so michael rooker then uses the knife that he swiped from paul walton's corpse uh -huh. and uses it to stab this guy in the foot and while the guy is screaming about the fact that his foot has been stabbed uh -huh. michael rooker grabs his shotgun and 
and shoots him through the gut, sending him over the ledge. Why isn't Sylvester Stallone doing all of this? He doesn't do anything in this movie. Arguably, Michael Rooker does more heroic deeds than Sylvester Stallone does in this film. I guess because somewhere in the many writers on this film, somebody was like, should Michael Rooker do anything in this movie? Yeah, he should do everything. Right, we should probably get him to do something. Special Agent Dr. Phil. He's walking around looking for this tracker and he sees this red marker bouncing here and there and he's like, what the fuck is going on? And then this rabbit hops out over a small snowbank with the beacon strapped to its back. So Stallone took the tracker Mm -hmm. and then he sees like a little rabbit hole, like a little hobble. Did he catch a rabbit and then put this tracker on the rabbit? Like, oh, this is going to be hilarious. He's going to think it's the, the, the money satchel, but it's going to be this bunny hopping around all over the place. It's going to drive him crazy. I don't know if you ever saw this uh, happen on that Ashton Kutcher show, Punked, but uh, I'm going <laughs> to punk him with a rabbit in his tracker. And sure enough, that's what happens. And as I mentioned in the introduction, this was a scene where Dr. Phil originally murdered the shit out of this rabbit. And then test audiences were like, oh my God, he killed that rabbit. <laughs> so they edit it so that he just shoots at it and it runs off how much did you enjoy when dr phil sees the rabbit and he screams out god damn it and then he fires the gun and he screams fuck you rabbit and then when he sees the rabbit you get that like dolly zoom like when brody sees the shark in jaws but it's a rabbit in the snow yeah it's like this feels intentionally bad I think it's just because it was a reshoot. You know, they they were like, oh, we've got a film of this rabbit hopping through the snow and then stick it in this movie where it never belonged. But after he sees this rabbit, Dr. Phil gets on the horn to Lithgow and he's Uh like, hey, uh, John Lithgow, I'm about to go look for Sylvester Stallone. It's going to be my last manhunt. And then Lithgow gives him shit for like, I thought you said we were using code names, you bastard. Hey, I don't give a shit about your name, code names, no names. John Arthur Lithgow. A couple of mountain rangers beat us. All right. By the way, anybody listening, last four digits of this asshole's social security number, four, 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 four. His first pet's name was Bucky. His mother's maiden name is Bouvier. Shut up, you idiot! You bastard! They'll be able to crack my Netflix account, you bastard! His password for everything is Boner69. That's what he uses. Hang up! Hang up, you bastard! (laughs) And sure enough, Paul Winfield and his crew flying around get this on the radio, and Paul Winfield's like, Hey, I think I recognize that voice. I think that's Dr. Phil. He peed his bed till he was 17. (laughs) He's afraid of power outlets for some reason. He's never kissed a girl or a guy. He can't ride bicycles. Also, hell, he can't even tie his own shoelaces. Shut up. Shut up. (laughs) All right. Well, I got to go. Adios, motherfucker. That's actual dialogue in this movie. Yeah. I'm going on my last official manhunt. See you later, assholes. And throws his radio (laughs) away. And so Paul Winfield's team is like, hey, we've we've got a bearing on that last signal. It's eight minutes away. Thereby putting a timer on this movie to let us know when it's going to be over. Right. Tick tock. Yeah. And so, sure enough, Dr. Phil is chasing Sylvester Stallone, who does, at this point, the big hero jump of this movie, where he just flies off the side of this mountain and catches a bunch of trees to break his fall so he doesn't die horribly. Trees, rocks, broken glass, bags of (laughs) roofing nails. Yeah, and (laughs) Lithgow, concerned that somebody might have done exactly what Paul Winfield is doing, which is to triangulate the this transmission takes off in the chopper now Mm -hmm. and as he's flying around apparently gas not a problem for him nope he sees janine turner just Mm -hmm. standing out in the middle of nowhere for no good reason but she's in for a rude surprise when someone she's never heard of seen or spoken to in this entire movie is flying this helicopter right she's like hey is that you paul walton oh shit and now that's somebody else and then he pulls a gun on her while he's flying a helicopter good luck hitting the side of a fucking barn like that take your best shot let's go and so dr phil ends up 
finding Stallone. Or he he's like tracked him to this wooden bridge over some icy waters. Yeah, I think they're at Castle Braun in the Transylvania Alps or Narnia or Tatooine. Right. There's like a bridge with these walkways and ropes draped between posts and a frozen tranquil creek beneath them. Like, where are we? Christopher Walken pops up in the corner and says, the ice is gonna break. Christopher Reeve is off to the side trying to talk to his dead dad. (laughs) (laughs) All these powers and I couldn't even save him. My son, I need somebody to (laughs) Stallone pops through this icy wood, grabs Dr. Phil and yanks him down. But in so doing, Stallone falls into the icy water and is floating under the ice. And so Dr. Phil is kind of tracking him. As yeah, so what you know what Stallone does, Bo? He takes off his sweater. Well, sure. Because <laughs> you are in water that is 32.1 degrees. Well, the last thing you want is to be weighed down by a wet sweater like that. And so he sees like Stallone trying to break through the ice and pulls out his gun. But then Stallone grabs that rock gun that he's got and shoots through the ice, killing Dr. Phil. What does that thing shoot? Like bolts or nails or rocks? It's like a potato gun, but for rocks? It's the same kind of thing that Anton Chigurh used to kill all those people (laughs) in No Country for Old Men. (laughs) Michael Rooker comes floating down on an umbrella shouting out, I'm Mary Poppins, (laughs) y'all! And he just shows up to pull his friend, whose body is going into shock and hyperventilation as his rapid heartbeat goes through the roof simultaneously. So Rooker just yanks Stallone out of the water again rooker is the hero of this movie once rooker has stallone out lithgow radios them and it's like Mm -hmm. you bastards i just wanted to let you know that i've got your friend janine turner what is your name again janine tecker what is it last name hunt first name oh we did that joke already (laughs) it's so he says i want my money you bastards norma stitz what you oh would you be serious for two seconds i'm trying to arrange a money exchange i've got someone that i think you might know do you know this woman she's got short hair she's was on top of a mountain is that something that you would be willing to trade for the money yes good let me ask you this have you ever seen northern exposure it's quite good (laughs) you bastards and yeah so they set a rendezvous point and once they get there like lithgow is flying around in his helicopter and stallone says i'll give you the money but you gotta first drop janine turn her off like in uh, behind me somewhere ah you resilient bastard i want my money and i want it now and so he does exactly what stallone says because he's a terrible villain and just Mm -hmm. drops her off behind her returns for the money well he's in the helicopter yeah and when he drops her off he lowers her down on this winch so it's a long cable with a hook at the end she hops off and scampers away to go hide right and then he says now give me my money so stallone's like yeah you want your money i'll give you your money come on fly over here and so he does and stallone just hurls the bag of money up into the blades of the helicopter whoopsie and so while john lithgow is trying to maintain control of the helicopter stallone grabs that winch cable and wraps it around that metal ladder that he used to Uh climb up the mountain yeah and lithgow recovers and is like you bastard i'll kill Mm -hmm. you with the blades of this helicopter so goes chasing after stallone and then off screen bow we hear i'm still mary poppins y'all and michael rooker comes running back into our movie i don't know how he got there just blasting a shotgun at this helicopter lithgow ends up losing control of the helicopter yet again Uh uh-huh and it falls off the side of the mountain where it kind of bounces against the wall of this cliff still attached to the ladder that someone had put there low these many years ago right and so Stallone, who had kind of held on to the ladder for safety when Lithgow was chasing him with the helicopter, gets jerked by the collapse of, of this helicopter and ends up falling onto the belly of the chopper. And he and Lithgow end up in a fist fight, which results, Chad, in Stallone biting this guy's arm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what we call Irish fighting, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> and then Stallone, for no reason that I can tell, says, Hey, you gotta remember to keep your hands and arms in the vehicle at all times, you know? And yep. then the rest of this ladder gives way. Stallone jumps off 
grabs the side of the cliff while the helicopter with Lithgow in it falls and explodes at the bottom of this mountain. Correct. And then like Spider-Man, Stallone shimmies his way back up to the top of this rock facing. Yes. Where he is greeted by Michael Rooker and Janine Turner. And then off in the distance, we get the fourth special appearance by Treasury Agent Paul Winfield and these two other nameless FBI lackeys. And they spot Stallone, Michael Rooker, and Janine Turner at the top of Suicide Point or wherever they are. And Michael Rooker shouts back, we're from the Rocky Mountain Rescue Group. If you're looking for John Lithgow, the bad guy of the movie, he's about 400 feet down below, burning alive in a wreckage of a helicopter that I shot out of the air with a shotgun. It was badass. (laughs) And Treasury Agent Paul Winfield says, it's great to see the star of our movie, you, Michael Rooker, coming out on top. And Michael Rooker says, ah, I'm not the star of the movie. I'm just the one who pretty much did everything. My name's Michael Rooker, but I go by my codename, Mary Poppins. The star of the movie is sitting here not doing jack shit. Well, I grandstand. That's my thing. And Paul Winfield says, congratulations, special agent Mary Poppins. You're a model for all future action movie heroes. I'm Mary Poppins, y'all. And then the movie ends. Truly, it ends with Paul Winfield being like, hey, we'll send somebody to get you later, I guess. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Bring me some to eat. I'm hungry. It's crazy. Stallone isn't even, he doesn't get the last line. He's not even standing up as the camera pans back because he probably wasn't there for shooting that day. Roll credits. Yeah, this is probably another standing because it looked like a human being and not some swollen homunculus. It's probably that dummy you saw getting chucked off the side of the ledge earlier. Oh, if only. (laughs) They're into the cliffhanger and it's just head scratching. You know, in the credits, there's an actor named Thor who plays a character named Thor. Is that the dog? (laughs) Was it? Maybe. Maybe it was the dog. I don't know. I was like, wait, seems like he was born to play that role. (laughs) And the the role he was born to play. You know, that's cliffhanger. It's really shockingly dull. It's not very exciting. There are no good characters and the villain's a real dud. This is a movie that I can safely not recommend to anyone anytime. I completely agree with that. You want to talk about the next episode of Pick 6 Movies, Bo? Because I'm going to let you decide what our next movie is going to be. Would you like to see Die Hard Uh at a sports arena or Die Hard in a prison? Spoilers, these are going to be my last two movies it doesn't matter which one you pick okay look i i want to save the prison for last because that's where i have the most experience uh <laughs> you know after i did those turns in county right. so uh let's do the sports arena that sounds exciting fantastic we will be welcoming two pick six movies again shockingly jean-claude van damme in sudden death where terror goes into overtime this is a movie that takes place during a hockey game and our bad guy here is is powers booth oh that sounds good i've never seen this movie so i'm kind of excited it's got a fantastic fight between jean-claude van damme and a guy in a hockey mascot outfit in a industrial kitchen in the belly of this place and i think he kills the guy in the like the duck or chicken costume by sticking him into a, a dishwasher all right, I'm I'm 100% on board with this. Oh, and to sweeten the pot, within the first two or three minutes, a kid gets killed. <laughs> oh, well, say no more, Chad. This may be the best movie we do this season. <laughs> I think we had a season that was going to be six movies featuring dead kids, and this was in there, and Casper. Pet Cemetery. Pet Cemetery is Ordinary People. <laughs> Is that one? <laughs> Jaws because of that Kittner boy. But we didn't do that because we thought it was in poor taste. <laughs> <laughs> and we are slaves to taste, Chad. That is one thing that <laughs> any listener will attest to. Excellent. Well, very good. Uh, as always, like, rate, review. You can email us at pick 6 at gmail.com. We've been getting more and more email. We love to hear from everybody. We typically try to respond back in a timely fashion, but, you know, we got stuff going on just like you do. You can find us on social media if you have an idea for a movie movie or a season please let us know we've had some really good suggestions from a few of our listeners some of them are really out there some of them are pretty good so we'll see what the future holds Bo, any final thoughts that you have on cliffhanger as episode three of this season's theme die hard ons oh you know i've been thinking about getting a reverse slippery finger and getting some sticky fingers you bastard <laughs> we'll see you in two weeks everybody